Hello and welcome to this video lecture for Chapter 6, Budget Planning. Our agenda for today is as follows. Two main things that we're going to talk about today. First of all, uh, how much will the project cost? And the second part of the lecture is when will the project costs occur? Uh, during budget planning, it's really these two questions, these important questions that need to be asked asked and answered. Okay, so let's move on. Just a reminder, we are we are working through our project life cycle. So we are currently in the planning phase and specifically we are at budget planning. Now, uh, just as a reminder, um, these uh, uh, planning activities, while they show up as being sequential through, through uh, different chapters, they really are in many ways happening uh, simultaneously during the planning phase in that they interact with each other. Now you'll see today in budget planning that uh, the schedule is a key input into budget planning, uh, but they do affect each other. Sometimes the budget can then affect the schedule and so on. So we see that throughout our, our planning activities. So we're right square in the middle of planning. Okay, just as a, a reminder, this is similar to our agenda page. Two main questions, uh, how much will the project cost? Uh, and that is the, to, uh, the result is the creation of the cost estimates. And the second question, when will the project costs occur, results in the creation of the detailed budget. So two main deliverables uh, here, cost estimates and detailed budget. So let's, uh, let's examine both of those. So first of all, how much will the project cost? Uh, recall that during the initiating phase, so prior to this, the overall budget for the project was documented in the project charter. So you remember that there is a starting budget. Now, that comes from a variety of places. That can be how much um, has been allocated to this project. That can be the maximum amount available. Uh, but it is the starting point. But oftentimes in the initiating phase, not a lot of analysis has gone into that number. So that's where uh, during the planning phase, that's when we, we really start to look at it uh, in detail. So during the planning phase, this amount is refined and in some cases re-estimated. Sometimes uh, the um, budget number for the, in the project charter may not have been reasonable uh, or maybe it's too low or even in some cases too high, it, it can be re-estimated re and adjusted. So uh, that can sometimes take place during the planning phase. Now costs come from a variety of, of sources. They, they, are, they are varied uh, and, and certainly different. They can be classified as being direct costs or indirect costs. Direct costs are, as the name implies, uh, directly applied to the project. For example, the salary costs of the people working on the project would be a direct cost. The amount of time that they spend would be directly applied to the project. Materials used are often direct costs as well. Uh, there are also, though, uh, costs known as indirect costs. Uh, they are costs that occur but are not direct, difficult or, or challenging sometimes to directly apply them to the project. For example, a, a project team that is uh, doing their work within a building, within the office building of the organization, uh, so they're one, you know, maybe a couple of rooms within the building, they are using costs of the rent, uh, the utilities, and the, the overall cost of the building, but there, it's not if they're not directly used. So uh, those are costs that are often a percentage of the cost may be applied to the projects or known as indirect costs. Uh, and so that's a, another way that costs may be attributed to a project. Now, one of the key things in this part of how much will the project cost is to estimate the costs, is to determine what they are going to be. And this is challenging. Uh, it's not always obvious what the costs will be. And, and so there is uh, a lot of uh, effort that is put into place in order to create as accurate estimates as, as possible. There are three main ways that we're going to look at in terms of, of estimating costs. The first one 
is known as analogous estimating. And this is, uh, and by the way, uh, more information on this you'll find in page, on page 80 of the textbook. I recommend that as you watch the, the video to uh, follow along in the textbook as well, because I'll be making various references to page numbers. Um, analogous esti estimating is looking at a previous project that where you perhaps did something similar and using and, and taking into account the actual costs that that project uh, incurred, and then using that to influence or to estimate the cost of the new project. So if you um, had a project, if you were doing a project, say, to uh, uh, landscape a backyard, if you were a landscaping company, you were landscaping a backyard, uh, and if you did a, a previous job for a customer that cost uh, maybe $10,000 and it was a similar job, well, then the the, the uh, new project, if it was a similar amount of work, would be perhaps $10,000, or if it was a little larger, maybe $12,000. So it's using your past uh, projects as a basis. So that's one form. There's parametric estimating. Now, parametric estimating is using um, standard rates that are available for some types of costs as a basis for estimating. Now, uh, it's best to, when you uh, describe parametric, is to use examples. For example, if you are planning a, a dinner or banquet and you go to a caterer, they will give you a parametric estimate. Uh, that is, they will, based on their costs and based on their experience, they will say, perhaps, uh, okay, to uh, plan this uh, banquet, it will be $20 per plate. So per person who, are, who is going to, to eat at the banquet, it's $20 per person. And so then what you do is using parametric estimating is you say, okay, $20 times the number of people that you expect to be there. So $20, say there was uh, 100 people, that would be a $2,000 estimate. Um, you know, other examples are if you are uh, planning to change the flooring in a house, um, you know, in a room, say, and say it's a 100 square feet of flooring. Uh, if you went to a, to a, a renovation store such as Home Depot, they may say it's uh, $3.99 per square foot of a certain type of flooring. Well, then you could take $3.99 and multiply it by the number of square feet. That's, a, that's parametric estimating. And finally, the third approach is bottom-up estimating. Now, bottom-up est bottom estimating uh, is the most detailed uh, way of estimating. And it is where once you have broken down the project into all of its work packages. And so in order to, to perform bottom-up estimating, it's important to have your work breakdown structure uh, completed or, or certainly um, fairly developed. Um, and then you create, you determine an estimate of each of the components or work packages. So it's very detailed. Uh, it may involve um, looking up costs on websites or determining the amount of work of each individual component and then adding it all up into the overall estimate. That's the, the bottom up uh, aspect of it. So those are the three forms of estimating or approaches to estimating that we'll include. Now, what are the advantages and disadvantages of each estimating? And each does have its pros and cons. You may look at one and say, well, that sounds like the best one. I'm just going to do that type. And, and that's where things get a little tricky in that it's not an either or, it's an and in, the, in this case. And again, I, I direct you to page 80 to see a detailed discussion of the pros and cons or the advantages and disadvantages of each type. But just in, in summary, analogous is uh, its advantages. It's fairly quick to do is assuming there is a previous project. You can do it fairly early in the planning and get a reasonably uh, reasonably accurate uh, estimate. It's, it's pretty good. Uh, the disadvantage is that, well, first of all, there may not uh, be a previous project. What if this is the first time you've done anything like this? There is, there, there is nothing to compare to. Uh, and it might be deceiving. You may be comparing, there's the proverbial apples to oranges that you may be comparing to something that isn't quite the same. So its accuracy is, is you know, good, pretty good, but not the highest level of accuracy. Uh, 
Parametric estimating is very accurate for those uh, instances where there are standard rates available, but one of the disadvantages of relying on parametric is that there's certain types of activities where a standard rate just does not exist. Um, it's only for specific things like the ones I've mentioned that a parametric estimate exists. And then finally, bottom-up estimating, it's one of its advantages. It's, it's, it's uh, the most accurate, generally, of these three approaches in that you are at a very detailed level. Um, now, the disadvantage is that you need to wait, essentially, until your work breakdown structure is, is created. So it's something you can't, you, you, you must do uh, or should do later in planning. Uh, so it's not as timely as often analogous and parametric estimates can be. It's not, you can't do it as quickly. And sometimes time is very important when you're in, in your planning and particularly when you're talking about costs. So those are the, uh, those are the types of estimating. So now I direct you to pause the video and, uh, and either read the pages of the case study on pages 80 to um, 82 of your textbook. Uh, or to click the link uh, in your PDF and and watch the video of the of the case study. So if you just do that, and then come on back here once you're once you're done that. Okay, so we're back, and we're now talk about the case study update in terms of what happened during this segment. So the project manager Sophie, as you as you saw in the case study primarily uses a bottom-up approach to estimate the project costs. You saw that uh, she uh, determined the um, type of, of uh, people. The, the, she doesn't at this point know who's working on her project uh, uh, yet to, to a great degree, but she knows the types of, of skills we sh she will need, for example, graphic designer and market specialist, and she knows the hourly rate, and she can she can work uh, work out how much time she's assuming that she'll need for each person on each activity. So you, you'll notice that it's at a very detailed level. Uh, she's also determining the amount of materials and equipment that she'll she'll need, the trade show banners and cards and so on, and is getting estimates for those. So you can see that there's a great amount of work. And again, that's one of the things that in a bottom-up approach is that it is very detailed. Uh, does take a while to do. She considers both the human resources or the people costs and what she classifies as other costs, materials and equipment. So she's classifying by by those two. And you'll you'll see on uh, pages 82 and 80, 82 to, to 84, I believe, or 82 to 83, uh, you'll see the um, the estimates that she came up with. And again, you'll notice that they're very detailed. The total estimate is 56520 which in this case is uh, $3,480 under the total budget of $60,000 that was defined originally in the project charter. So this would be an example of a good news scenario where our planning, we are under the $60,000. Now, if it would have been over the $60,000, budget defined in the project charter, well, that would be a discussion we would need to then uh, have with our project sponsor, where we would say, uh, the, looks like our plans say that we are going to, we're on course to spend more than $60,000. What should we do? And that's that, that would be a good discussion to have. You certainly don't want to ignore that. But in this case, we are uh, just under $3,500 under budget in terms of our plans. Uh, now, this, this amount uh, has a name, this, this uh, uh, under budget. And it's, again, defined on page 84 of the textbook, uh, which I will tell you is known as budget contingency. This is our contingency, our budget contingency that we have available to us. Uh, now, ideally, it would be nice if we brought the project in under budget at 56520 or similar. Uh, but we have that extra almost $3,500 to work with. So we now at this point, we've got our, our estimates. And, and here they are. These are, this is the same information which is in the textbook, but we can see the level of detail that we're at. Uh, we can see the human resources, total human resources cost 
estimates are 51920 So you can see in this particular project, the people costs, their hourly costs, salary, is the majority of the costs. We can see our other costs are 4000 or budgeted to be or estimated to be $4,600 for a total of 56520 Okay, so we're now on to uh, step two. When will the project costs occur? So this is our next question is, okay, we know that we're, uh, you know, sort of on track to spend, uh, you know, 56,000, uh, a little bit more. Uh, but now the next question is, well, when are they likely to occur? Uh, the cost information contained in the cost estimates is combined with the project schedule information contained in the project schedule. So this is an instance where, okay, now what we need in order to create the, the detailed budget is the schedule. So uh, this is another instance where cost planning requires some of the other planning uh, work to be done. So you need to have your project schedule in pretty good shape in order to do de uh, in order to determine when the project costs will occur and to create the uh, detailed budget. So again, I direct you to um, review the uh, read the the uh, case study, which is on page eighty four. So either read that in your textbook or click on the link below in your uh, PDF. And, and watch the video uh, for it. Uh, so do that now and then come on back here and we'll discuss. Okay, we are back. So let's, let's look at the case study in terms of creating the detailed budget. So Sophie decided to organize the detailed budget. She, she decided to summarize it. Now, she could have had it at the same level of detail as the detailed estimates, so had it very uh, detailed. She decided to collapse it to just have uh, the lines HR costs and other costs. So sort of summarize it. She she felt that she didn't need the detail that is contained in the cost estimates, but it all balances. So that's just one thing to 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 bear in mind. Now uh, she could have decided otherwise. This was just the decision that she that she made. So using her cost estimates as an input. So she had her cost estimates, she had her project schedule. She then calculates the planned costs for each week. Now, you could see in the case study, the detail that she was going through is that, uh, you know, for each, each cost estimate, each line of the, of the, in the cost estimates, she was looking at the schedule and figuring out, well, what weeks would that occur in? So she was plotting the cost. Uh, again, you can see this is fairly detailed work. Uh, but it's important work. So make sure that you really read the case study uh, again, and, you know, listen to it or read it a couple of times and really understand what's happening there in terms of determining when each of those costs are planned to occur. That allows the creation of the, uh, the detailed uh, budget. Now, this one that we see is based, is created on a, on a weekly basis. So we can see uh, the basic characteristics of a detailed budget in that we have our cost categories here. And we mentioned the way she decided to do it is to break it down by phase. And then within each phase have the HR costs and other costs. Now in the initiating uh, phase, there were no other costs. So it wasn't included. You can see in executing there were HR and other costs. But we can see that the costs that are planned within each time period. Now, again, this looks fairly simple. This, you know, two thousand and eighty dollars here and eight thousand uh, dollars, eight thousand eight hundred here, looks pretty simple. But there was a lot of thinking that went into uh, what uh, the the amount of cost to be included or to be incurred in each week. Uh, we can see that there are totals by time or by week going along the bottom we can see the totals uh, for each of the lines going across here and it all balances of course this needs to balance exactly to the cost estimates if that did not equal fifty six thousand five hundred and twenty uh, that would be a problem um, so this is this is our our end result now this was an example the previous slide was an example of a weekly uh, the, the level the time periods were weekly oftentimes detailed budgets, particularly, particularly those that are 
um, longer term, ones that will, will, will go over six months or 12 months or 18 months, their detailed budgets will um, be organized on a monthly basis. And here's the same detailed budget uh, indicated or that is organized by month. So in this case, our project actually spans over three months. It starts in March and ends in May. And you can see now the costs per month. Again, it, it completely, uh, it uh, balances to 56,520. Um, and so uh, this is just showing two different uh, ways of level of detail. They're both valid detailed budgets. So the level of detail in the cost categories and the number of time periods depends on the financial management needs of the project. So you've seen one example of this, but it's not to say it's the only way. Um, you know, you may have some projects that may have quarterly time periods, some may be monthly. Uh, instead of HR and other costs, we could have them broken down in, you know, at completely at the work package level. So there are um, there, there are different levels of detail. So that's just something uh to uh, to consider now, one of the key you'll probably as you're reading this and, and watching this be be thinking to yourself, gee, this this is a lot of detail. Like, what what is why why are we doing all this? Like, couldn't we just have created the estimates and stop? Why are we doing this detailed budget thing? Because it seems like it's a lot of work, and frankly, it it can be. It it is a significant uh, amount of effort to to go in. Uh, to do this, uh, there are software packages and so on that can help with this. But there is, there, there's, you know, the, you can't really sugarcoat this. There is work involved in this. So, what are the advantages of a detailed budget? Now, I direct you to page 87 of your text. It describes the the advantages. Uh, but the to summarize the benefits, there really are two main ones. One is the management of project costs. Um, Keeping track of your costs and, and managing that to ensure that you stay within budget or you're really understanding if you're going to go over budget is extremely important. Your project sponsor really wants to know that. Uh, so having a detailed budget gives you a map that you can track your actual costs to. And if you see your costs at a certain point in the project starting to um, exceed your planned cost at that point, that becomes a flag, a red flag that you may want to, or you should uh, address. Uh, so that is a key aspect of a detailed budget is that it helps you manage the costs as you are executing the project. So that's number one. Number two is it gives you an idea of, of the required cash flow of the, of the uh, project. Uh, many organizations, particularly small organizations that may not have a lot of cash kind of lying around and may have to go to the bank to get uh, to get credit to finance the project, they're going to want to know when they need the money so that they can go to the bank or or or, or uh, get the money available to be able to spend it. Um, and so that that's where uh, knowledge of that in the form of a detailed budget allows for that level of planning to to take place. So it's really being able to manage the required cash flow of the of the project. So those are the two main advantages, important advantage or important reasons for doing a detailed budget. So that is the end of the uh, video lecture. Well, thanks, and we will see you next time.